Hey, listen, I uh, have a sense that today's message is very important. Uh, not that they're not all important. Uh, and today's message is not important because I'm, I'm the one preaching it. I don't mean it that way at all. But here's what's going to happen today. We are rounding out the Sermon on the... Yeah, Dennis, go ahead, have a seat. You guys can have a seat. <laughs> Dennis leads the way. Uh, this message is important because we're in the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus is rounding this out. And... Uh, it's pretty significant how this ends, actually. And so what I want to do today is ask you to just relax and, and maybe just for a few minutes, just set your the problems, the challenges, the concerns, the worries aside. Not that they're not important, not that they don't matter, or, but just for a few minutes. I mean, you, you got here, you're here, and now there's something the Lord, I believe, really wants to say to you, to clarify some things for you today. So... Let's just bow for a moment or two and just be quiet before the Lord and ask him to help you prepare your mind and your heart. And those of you that are joining us online, same thing for you. Just get quiet and be still and ask the Lord to take away anything that you're worried about, anything you're afraid of today. Ask the Lord to remove distractions from your mind, from your heart. Ask the Lord to prepare your mind and your heart to receive his word this morning. Now, would you be brave enough to ask the Lord to help you follow through and do what it is that he says to you this morning, whatever he's asking of you. Lord, you know that we're apprehensive about that for different reasons. Maybe a lot of us are apprehensive ab about saying yes to you before we hear what you're going to say. Maybe not so much because of you, but because we've been burned before by people. But Lord, you love us and you only want the very best for us. And you want us to trust you. So help us with that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. How are you? Good to see you. Listen, let's, uh, let me start with this. Let me ask you a question. How many of you like a good recommendation? And what I'm thinking about is like maybe restaurants. You, you've got a friend that ate at a certain, certain restaurant and they had a great experience and the food was good and all that. And they said, hey, man, you need to check this out. You like that when that happens? How about a good doctor? Man, she's a great pediatrician. You ought to get your kids in to see so-and-so. Good dentist. Good recommendation there. How about an auto mechanic? <laughs> yeah, they are actually going to do the work and they're going to do it on time and charge you a fair price and all that. that. You like those kinds of things? Right? A good plumber? How about that one? You like it? Here's a guy that does the job and... Here's a company that you can trust. and count. Are you all okay with good recommendations? How many things in life do you need good recommendations for? A lot of things, right? Unless you know everybody and everything, you need some recommendations and we live by those. How do you feel when you get a good recommendation from somebody? How do you feel? This is, boy, how do you feel when you get a good recommendation and it works out for you? There you go. I knew you had it in you. Yes, absolutely. We feel good. Did you know that Jesus Christ gave... The single best recommendation that's ever been made in the history of mankind. And let me read it to you. He says this in Matthew chapter 7. If you have a Bible or a smart device that you would like to join us today. I'd love for you to see this with your own eyes and hear it with your ears today. Jesus said this in chapter 7 verse 13. He said, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide. And the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. 
For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. In this part of Jesus' message, the Sermon on the Mount, he's already talked about several different things. And if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, he started out talking about the Beatitudes. And then he describes the character of the kind of people that will be followers of his. That This is what they will look like. This is how they'll respond. This is what they'll do with their lives. When he gets to chapter 7, he's finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. And he basically says this. It comes down to two things. It comes down to two choices. He says, in all of life, there are two gates. And those two gates lead to two ways or two paths. And those paths lead to two different destinations. And he says, basically, it's up to you to decide who you're going to follow and what you're going to do. And so he says, enter the narrow gate. And it's interesting, this is not just a recommendation. This is not just a polite invitation. This is actually an imperative statement, meaning it's a command. He says, if you want what it is that I have to offer to give to you, enter through the narrow gate. That's what he's saying here. And here's the thing about this. Do you realize that no one decides for you? Nobody pushes you through the gate. And you can't decide for anybody else. You can't make somebody else go through this gate that Jesus Christ is talking about. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to have your children in a church and around Bible-believing people, people that love Jesus and are following Jesus, not perfectly, but, but the direction that Jesus is going, you want to get your kids around that. That's why it's so important, like I said, to be in a good Bible-believing church. Uh, it's even better if you model that in the home that you live in so that your kids can see you following Jesus and, and follow your example. Very important. Uh, Jesus says this gate to go through is very narrow. How, how narrow is the gate Jesus is talking about? In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The gate is so narrow, it's a single person, and that person is Jesus Christ, right? Verse 13 Jesus says that the gate is wide that leads to destruction. How wide is the gate that leads to destruction? It's so wide that everybody in the world who has not gone through the narrow gate basically goes through the wide gate. And how broad is this road? Jesus says the way is broad. How broad is the way? The way is so broad that everybody who's not on the narrow way, who's not entered through the narrow gate, actually is on the broad way. It, the whole world fits on this broad way. And Jesus said there are many who enter through it? How many? The whole world. Every single person who does not receive Jesus Christ, does not enter through the narrow gate, is on the broad way, has gone through the broad gate, and basically this is the broad way that leads to destruction Jesus talks about here. Jesus is perfectly clear, folks. There's no third way. There's not a third option. You might say, well, there's a lot of religions and there's a lot of ways, a lot of different paths lead me to heaven. Not according to Jesus. And Jesus is God. And what does he know? He knows everything. And he's just telling you the truth here, right? And here's something interesting about the broad way that he describes these two different paths. You don't have to look for the broad way. You don't have to search this out. You don't have to go, you know what, I'm going to try to get on this broad way. All you have to do is be alive and you're automatically on the broad way. Why is that? How did that happen to you? You, were, you guys were in the first service. You know the answer, don't you? But I'm not going to ask you because it's been a long time since the first service. How did you wind up on the broad way? You were being born. You were born, right. You were born with a sin nature. You, you didn't vote on it. You didn't go, well, you know, I'll have one of those. Because Adam and Eve were your original parents and they sinned against God in the garden, Sin nature, that was original sin. The sin nature is passed on from person to person, generation to generation, all the way to the present time. And that is mankind's basic problem is sin. It's his sin nature. And so according to Jesus, he's saying that everybody starts out on the broad way, right? And, and the funny thing about, it's not funny, but the thing about the broad way is it's the easy way. It's, it's, the, it's the way with basically no boundaries, it's, it's the way where there's not a lot of pressures, not a lot of people telling you what you ought to do and should do and shouldn't do and all that kind of stuff. Not a lot of rules on the broad way. The broad way promises the most freedom. The broad way is the most appealing to you. The broad way is attractive. In fact, the broad way is what comes 
natural to you. This is what we, you and I do. This is how we go through life is the Broadway. ACDC wrote a song about the Broadway. I don't know if they meant to write a song about this, but they wrote a song. Bon Scott sang these lyrics. He said, he said no stop sign, no speed limit. Ain't nobody going to get in my way. Hey, mama, look at me. I'm headed for the promised land. Those are the lyrics to their song. What's the title of the song? Highway to where? Highway to hell. Jesus is not singing a song. Jesus is defining reality for every single human being on planet earth. He says, for the gate is small. In verse 14, the gate is small and the way is narrow. That word narrow also is translated meaning hard. It's not easy. But you know what? Jesus is completely open and honest with us. He's up front. He, does not, he doesn't bait and switch. He doesn't say, hey, you know, follow me. It's going to be easy. There's nothing to it. In fact, he says it's exactly the opposite of that. It's actually a very hard way to live. Which is why in other places in the New Testament, Jesus says that you need to think long and hard about following me. You need to count the cost before you make a decision of whether or not you're actually going to follow me because it's going to be a difficult road for you to walk. And here's your first fill in if you're taking notes today. Jesus is not talking about a single decision, but about a decision that begins a way of living. It is a way of living he's talking about. That way of living he just got through overviewing in the Sermon on the Mount. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. When Jesus originally gave this message, it's not like he taught verse chapter 5 and he said, okay, let's take 10, everybody go get something to eat, come back, we'll do chapter 6. He gave the Sermon on the Mount all at one time. He gave the whole thing, we just, it's, it's broken up into 5, 6, and 7, but he says, here's how it starts, here's the Beatitudes, here's a description of the people that are born again, people that are in the kingdom, and he says, this is how these people actually live. Jesus is describing a decision in this ver these verses, that starts with salvation. It begins with conversion, and then it leads to a lifetime, listen, a lifetime of commitment to following Jesus Christ, right? To become the kind of person that he describes in these chapters, it takes a transformation of us on the inside. This is what Jesus is talking about, is entering the narrow gate is conversion. It is salvation. It's the starting point. It's surrendering to Jesus it's asking Jesus to come into our lives to forgive us of our sins and make us alive. That's exactly what it is. If you're taking notes again, here's the next fill-in for you. The narrow gate is who? Jesus. And the narrow way is, guess what? Obedience to Jesus. The narrow gate is Jesus and the narrow way is obedience to Jesus. This is why, Pastor Rob and I encourage you to read your Bible so often. Why? Because if you're going to know how to obey Jesus, you're going to need to know what it is that he wants you to obey, what it is that he says, right? And so we encourage you to read your Bible so you'll get to know Jesus in this way. But I want you to notice where Jesus says that the narrow way actually leads. He says the narrow way leads to where? Have I lost you already? The narrow way leads to where? life. He, he's the narrow gate. Obedience leads to life. Um, let me read it for you. Okay. He says the way is narrow that leads to life. It leads to life. You say what life? It's the life of Jesus in you. It's the life of him actually. It's, it's actually his life. He describes this in John chapter 10 as abundant. He says, my, the life I give is abundant. And some of you, and maybe you watch it online, you're saying to yourself, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. My life is abundant. In fact, it's too abundant. I got so many things going on. I got so many deadlines, so many details, so many people calling to me, so many distractions, expectations. And to be honest with you, Scott, I'm, I'm, it's super overabundant. I'm stressed out, in fact. I, I'm really anxious, actually. Uh, I, I'm just overwhelmed with life. And can I tell you something? That is not what Jesus is talking about. The abundant life that Jesus is talking about is an abundance of joy, an abundance of peace, an abundance of contentment. It, it is a life where you live on purpose. You know why you're here, and you know what you're supposed to be doing while you are here, and you're doing those things. 
you have a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction that you don't get anywhere else but in Jesus Christ. And not only that, it is a life of hope. And it is a life that leads to an eternity. And in that eternity is an inheritance. And you say, well, what's in the inheritance? Everything there is, is in the inheritance. And that's what he has on reserve for his children, for his followers. And I want to say again, Jesus doesn't say that the narrow way is the easy way. That's the broad way. He says the narrow way is the best way. Jesus' way includes adversity, pain, suffering, sorrow, challenge, a fair amount of ambiguity. Read the New Testament and you will see that it's all right there. Jesus doesn't say it's the easy way. In fact, he says it's the hard way. But he says, guess what? I'm going to be with you for the entire journey in the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm always going to protect you. I'm always going to provide for you. There's never going to be anything that you face that's bigger than me. Nothing's ever complicated to me. And I promise to be with you. And even the hard stuff that you go through that you don't understand, I'm going to take those things and bring good out of those things. Romans 8, 28. Because he's that good and because he loves you that much. And that's the narrow way that he's talking about. And notice how Jesus describes the people on the narrow way. He says, there are few who find it. No one ever stumbles through the narrow gate. No one ever accidentally goes through the narrow gate, right? He says there are few who find it. It's only the people who are actually looking for it find it. This is my second appeal to parents and grandparents and those of you that are taking care of kids, your your guardians of children. This is why it is so important for you to bring them to church. This is why camps are so important. I'm so glad Hillary said what she said in the giving talk because she's exactly right. Camp is a wonderful place that kids get to go where social media is not and they're not this and that. It's, it, it's not, it pulls them out of the world for a week where they get a big heavy dose of Jesus and love and compassion and fun and good things and friendship. It's a very positive thing. But the thing about camp is it's one out of 52 weeks, right? We got 51 other weeks. That's why you want to have them in a good church. That's why you want, as a, as a parent or, or a grandparent, you yourself want to be reading the Bible. You want to be thinking about these things. You want to have your thinking and your behavior, your motives changed and conforming to Jesus Christ because they're watching you and they take their cues from you, at least for a while. And so it's important that you have your children in a good church that teaches the Bible. Amen? Okay, reality check. Question, how do you know which path you're on? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote about this in the Corinthian, to the Corinthians in the second chapter of, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. He said this, he said, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to test somebody else. He said, you test yourself to see if you are actually in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you failed the test? Test yourselves. How would you do that? Is there a test that you can take? You know, you can fill out this and that will show you, that will prove. No, but you, you need to know if you're actually born again or not. You need to know if you've entered the narrow gate, as Jesus said. Have you come to a place in your life, at this point in your life, that you have recognized your need for a Savior, that being Jesus, and have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Okay? And you say, and th- let me just say this. This is where it's dangerous. This is where the people that grow up in church, this is dangerous to you. And here's the reason why. I cannot tell you through the years how many people that I have met that have said to me, hey, you know, I I grew up in the church, therefore I'm a Christian. My granddad was a pastor, and so I'm a a Christian. Uh, My dad was a deacon, and, and he was very involved. We were there every time the door was open. I mean, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, Sunday morning. I mean, we, I grew up, in, I went to camp, I did all these things. I, I'm a Christian because I'm familiar with the lingo. I'm familiar with the language, the practices, the songs. I, I could preach myself. Maybe I have preached. I don't know. This is the danger of growing up in church and never coming to the realization that you're a sinful person and you need a Savior. 
You can't hang out at McDonald's and become a hamburger, can you? I mean, that. it's a decision that you make. And that's the point. That's how you enter the gate, the narrow gate. And listen, if God enters your life, listen to me. If God enters your life, you're going to know that. <laughs> it, it, you, you are not going to be the same if God enters your life. If you're thinking, well, I, I prayed a prayer, I signed a card, I walked an aisle, I did something, therefore I'm in, I checked that box, I'm going to heaven. Just keep listening to what Jesus says and then you can decide if that's true or not. Is that fair enough? Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Knew I could count on you. That's good. So here's the issue. Oh, and here, I, I left off number two. Here's the second thing. If you really want to know if you have entered the second or entered the gate, the narrow gate, here's the second part of that. Here's the question. Are you obeying Jesus' commands? You say, well, yeah, yes, yeah, sort of, sometimes, occasionally. Which ones are you talking about? Hmm. Here's the question, and let me just say this to you, in case you get into a works, you know, oh, he's preaching works up there, and we're saved by the things that we do. Here's what Jesus said in this same Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, to be specific, he told us that as we pray daily, pray for forgiveness of our sins. Do you know why? Because we continue to sin, even after we've walked through the narrow gate and we've received Jesus. So he's not talking about sinless perfection, but here's the issue, and this is your feeling, and I think this is probably the most important thing uh, in the outline today, and it's basically this. The key is this, is your heart's desire to truly follow Jesus and do what he says? Is your heart's desire to truly follow Jesus and do what he says? Is that, is that your bent? Is that the path that you're on? I mean, as you're living your life, going to school, raising kids, graduating, buying groceries, voting, I mean, what the, all, as you're living, going camping, whatever it is you're doing out there, as you're living your life, are you, re, are you basically building your life on Jesus Christ? Are you, are you learning what he says? Are you familiarizing yourself with what his commands even are? How am I going to obey Jesus' commands if I really don't even know what they are? Again, this is why we encourage you to read your Bible. Rob and I don't work on commission. We don't encourage you to read your Bible so that if more of you read your Bible, we make more money. We don't, we don't do it that way. We encourage you to read your Bible because that's where you're going to learn about Jesus and who he is and what he says and what he wants to give you and help you with. That's why we encourage you to read your Bible. That's how you're going to know what it is that he wants from you specifically and how he wants to live his life through your particular specific life. You're only going to know that through what Jesus Christ teaches. So how do you know? Keep reading. I'm back in Matthew chapter 7. I'm back to Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 15. And here's what he says. He says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The world has been and continues to be full of people that claim to be Christ followers. They look like Christ followers. They sound like Christ followers. They teach like Christ followers. They smell like Christ followers. But in fact, they actually are not. He continues in verse 16. He says, you'll know them by their fruits. If you want to know how can you recognize false prophets, then look at what they do. Not what they teach and what they say, but what they do. And by the way, you cannot just necessarily recognize this overnight. You can't just listen to somebody, watch somebody, and then go, yep, that person's of God. Yep, that's, I got it. I got it. Over time, you will see what that person really is. Who that, that's according to Jesus. He says, grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. He's making a statement of the nature of the tree. The nature of the tree determines what kind of fruit it produces. Verse 18, he says, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. He's giving further clarification on the nature of the tree because the nature of the tree determines the kind of fruit the tree bears. In verse 19, he says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. How many trees is he talking about? Every tree that's not a good tree. 
So every person, and the trees are metaphors for people. And every person that does not go through the narrow gate is not born again, is on the broad way, is a bad tree that produces bad fruit. That tree, every tree, is cut down and thrown into the fire. You say, Scott, I don't like your tone. I don't like what you're teaching up there. And I would just say to you, this is what Jesus is saying. This, Jesus is God. And what does he know? What? Everything. He knows everything. He knows what he's talking about. And so instead of arguing with him or rationalizing and going, well, you know, yeah, but it might be wise to kind of go, Jesus, I'm not sure about this. Help me understand. That's a better posture. That'll get you further. According to Jesus here, he says in verse 20, so then you will know them by their fruits. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Okay, so Jesus is talking about fruit here. So what strawberries, bananas, what is he talking about? He mentions grapes. Is there any other place in the Bible that talks about fruit that you know of? Yeah, fruit of the Spirit. Where's that? I'm new here. Help me out. Where is it? Galatians. You're right. We're at in Galatians. Do you know? There's five chapters, six chapters. Which chapter? Chapter five. And here's what I, I'm going to give you a little quiz now. You, you know you're going to have to think today, did you? Dog on it. You had to come to church and think about stuff. So I'm going to give you a little quiz, and I want you to tell me the answer to which two trees are in verse 16. So you tell me the names of the trees. I'll read the verse to you. You tell me the trees. Paul the Apostle, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, meaning what he wrote is true. This is not some guy's opinion. This is God's word. It's truth. He says, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What are the two trees? The Spirit and the flesh. That's a good tree, and that's a bad tree that Jesus is talking about. Now watch this in verse 19. Jump down there. Galatians 5, 19. Now the deeds of the flesh, or the fruits of the flesh, the bad tree. He says, the deeds of the flesh are evident. What does it mean? What does evident mean? You can see it. You can recognize it. What did Jesus say about fruit? He said, you can recognize it. You know the tree by what? By its fruit. All right. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Do you know what that means? This is not a comprehensive list. This is a representative list. These are the kinds of deeds or the kinds of fruits that people on the broad way, the bad tree, actually produce. Now let me ask you a question. Am I just being mean? Is the Apostle Paul being mean and criticizing the tree? He's just saying that this tree produces, it's a bad tree because it has a bad nature because it, and it produces bad fruit. Why does the tree produce bad fruit? Because of the sin nature. The tree produces the fruit of the nature of the tree. Apples produce apples. Peaches, peach trees produce, I gave it away. Peaches, right, exactly. A bad tree, this is why Jesus said a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Because the nature of the tree is such that it produces the fruit that's in alignment with its nature. This is exactly why Jesus came. Because we all are bad trees, if I can say it that way. We all start out that way. We're all on the broad way. We all bear that kind of fruit. That's the kind of life that Paul is saying, this is kind of how these people are. This is what it looks like. This is how they live. And he says, in these things, he says, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you. I've told you before. That those who practice, this is very important, underline that or circle it. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. They practice these. In other words, this is the way they live. It doesn't mean, when I look at that list, I'll be honest with you. When I look at that list, I've done most of those things as a Christian. But that's not 
my direction. That's not my bent. That's not what I want. I do love Jesus. I am on the narrow way. I want to follow him. I really, really do want my life to align with his, but I've just not arrived yet. Have you? Have you? We're on our way. But the point is, yeah, I've done that stuff, but I've entered through the narrow gate. I've accepted Jesus Christ. And then he describes that person. In verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. He didn't say the fruit of the person. He said the fruit of the Spirit, capital S, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, these are the deeds that the Holy Spirit produces in a life who's accepted Christ. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's pretty much all of you, isn't it? And love your neighbor as yourself. What is the new commandment? Jesus gave that one. What did he say? He said, love one another even as I have loved you, that you love one another. Do you know what the telltale fruit of a person's life who's been transformed by Jesus Christ is? It's love. That's why Paul wrote that one first. This is not a, like a random thing he wrote down. The telltale sign that a person is born again is a growing sense of love. Love for God and love for other people. Now here's what I would say to you in love. If you're not more loving right now than you were this time last year, or let's say three years ago, let's give you some grace this morning. Let's say that you're no more loving today than you were a year ago or three years ago. You might want to check the nature of the tree, according to the Bible. This is something the Lord does in you. This is not something you must run. This is not something you go, you know what? I should be more loving, so I'm just going to grip my teeth. And I'm going to bear down and I'm going to become more loving. No, you will not. This is why you need to be born again. Because you can't produce what Jesus is talking about. Only the Spirit can produce the fruit of the Spirit. You cannot. You're involved, but you're not the Holy Spirit. He changes you on the inside where you want to be loving. And so you start living that way. And the Holy Spirit helps you become more of who He is right? And so that's not all the fruit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why is there no law against such things? Because these things, in fact, fulfill the law. This is the kind of person that we become as we let the Holy Spirit into our lives and we surrender to him and we let him teach us and show us and empower us and change us. That is what he's talking about here. And then verse 24, and we're going to leave this book. He says, now those who belong to Christ. How do you a person get to the point where they belong to Christ? How did you get to where you belong to Christ? You went through the narrow gate. You accepted Christ as your Savior. And now you belong to Christ. And so you're, you're in his family. And it says, now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So in other words, there is a part for you in this. It's not like you receive Jesus Christ and you kind of go, I'll check with you on judgment day. And I got it from here. And you just kind of live your life. And magically, you just become this person that bears this kind of fruit. You go from being a bad tree to a good tree, and you have nothing, your, your work is done after that. That's not true. You're crucifying the flesh. In other words, you're saying no to the things that are in that first list more and more, right? And you're saying yes to the Holy Spirit, and he's producing this kind of fruit in your life. And this, over time, is more and more of who you're becoming. And this is the fruit that your life bears, and this is what you look like. And that's why God says this is how you'll know them, by their fruits, Back to Jesus, and we'll wrap this up with what he says. In verse 21, and I'm telling you, I told the crowd this morning, the 8 o'clock crowd, 9 o'clock crowd, I said, you know, to me, this is the most solemn verse in the entire Bible that I know of. This is the most serious, sobering verse in the Bible right here. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not talking about the pagans, the people that are absolutely, no, I don't believe in God. No, I haven't received Jesus. No, he's not talking about those people. Those people are clear. Hey, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe there's a judgment or a hell or whatever. I just live my life. I'm, you know, he's not talking about those people. He's talking about the people who went to church. He's talking about the people who knew the lingo. They knew the language. He's talking about people that were moral people, good, upstanding. They look good. They talk good. They smell good. They act good. They're familiar. They admire the gospel. They respect Jesus Christ. They affirm that that would be a great way to live your life. They may know Christians that live that way, and that's what their life is like. Jesus says these people, he says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But... He or she who does the will of my Father. If you seriously believed, if you seriously believe that Jesus Christ, what he's saying there, that this issue will either get you in or keep you out of heaven, would you want to know what that is? Please understand, I, I didn't write this. I wrote the sermon, I didn't write the Bible. This is Jesus telling you and me this. A lot's on the line. And he wants you to get this right. So what is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is that you're converted. That you were a bad tree. You were on the broad road. You were bearing that fruit. You were lost. You were on the highway to hell. He doesn't want you to end up there. And the only way you're not going to end up there is by doing the first thing he said in the Sermon on the Mount, and that is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, you recognize there's not one thing in your life that you can bring to God and say, hey, this is what's going to get me in. It's because I am whatever. You fill in the blank. There's nothing you can offer God. All you can do is come to God and say, God, I... I can't save myself. I am a sinner. And I need you to forgive me. And that's exactly why he sent Jesus the narrow gate. And he says, enter through the narrow gate. It's a command. Do this. You can't just think about this indefinitely. You can't just, and let me say to my graduates here, you can't just say, if you're not already a Christian, you know what? What I'm going to do is live my life. And then when I get old, right before I die, I'm going to accept Jesus. And then I'll go to heaven. And that'll be, I mean, you can. And a lot of people do that. I did that for a while. Do you realize how foolish that is? Yes, you do or you don't. It's crazy. Why put off what it is that he's trying to give you? He's not trying to give you cancer. He wants to give you abundant life. And so I'm back to the text. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. The will of his father is that you're born again and that you follow his son. Not just you prayed a prayer, signed a card, walked an aisle, and then you're good. I'm done. I said, that, I said those words, I'm going to heaven. According to Jesus, there's more to it than that. Then he says in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, not, not a few, many. How many is many? I don't know. It's a bunch, according to Jesus. Many will say to me on that day. What day is he talking about? Judgment day. It is coming. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. Remember what we saw in Galatians? Practice. Lawlessness. What's lawlessness? It's against the law. It's against God. It's against Christ. Jesus never said that these people did not cast out demons and do miracles. He didn't say that. They did, in fact. You can be impressed with certain things, certain miraculous, incredible things. Jesus never said these people didn't do that. What he said was that you, I never knew you depart from me because you practiced what? Lawlessness. Your heart was never converted. Therefore, you never really made me the priority of your life, the pursuit that I want you to pursue. You've got to be born again. 
And then we follow Jesus, according to Jesus. So let's take a couple of moments and just have some quiet reflection. And I want to ask you some things. So close your eyes, bow your head if you would, please. And those of you watching online, just listen to these questions. First of all, do you really believe that the narrow way, the Jesus way, is the only way for you? Maybe you're not convinced. Maybe you say, well, yeah, Scott, that's probably true, but I have some questions. I have, I have some doubts. And I would say to you, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. As Pastor Rob shared last Sunday, and here's the reason why. Those who seek the narrow gate, find it. Jesus is helping you find it. That is one of the reasons you're here this morning. That's one of the reasons you're watching online. Because he wants you to find him. Keep seeking. For some of you, you've come to the realization over this last few minutes that perhaps you're not really born again. Maybe you've been a good person up to this point. Maybe you've been moral. Maybe you've been a good citizen of the United States. Pay your taxes. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You're a good person. Good people go to hell apart from Jesus Christ. Maybe you're at a place where you're ready to recognize that you need Jesus as your Savior. That's a great place to be. How do you do that? How do you receive Jesus as your Savior? You ask Him to come into your life. You recognize that you can't save yourself, and that's why God sent Him, is to save you. You say, how does that happen? Very simple. You pray, which is talking to God, and you ask Him to forgive you. And if that's what you want to do, then I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. And he will save you. And you can pray out loud. You can pray silently. Whisper these words. Pray this prayer to Jesus now. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's son. I do believe that you died on the cross to pay for sins for humanity and for me. I recognize I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. I put my trust in you. Please forgive me of my sins. Help me to start trusting you living on the narrow way as best as I know how I surrender control of my life to you thank you for loving me and thank you for saving me in Jesus name if you just prayed that prayer there is a connection card in front of you and the seat back in front of you it looks like that If you would pull that out, put your contact information on there and let us know that you accepted Christ as your Savior today. We would appreciate that. Or if you want to chat with somebody, you're still not convinced, you've got some questions, you want to know some things, if we can help you with that, just say, hey, I'd like to chat with somebody. But be sure and put your contact information on there so we can follow up with you. You can leave it in your seat or you can drop it in the black boxes on your way out of the auditorium this morning. Continuing in prayer. Maybe you have entered the narrow gate and you know that you have and you're on the narrow way and you've been saved for a while, but maybe you're not growing like you need to and want to. Maybe you're not passionate about Jesus anymore. You're not, you haven't really been following him like you want to. How would you get going again? The first thing I would recommend is the daily Bible reading schedule. If if you'll look at our website, there it is. We're looking at the gospels. We're reading through the gospels through the entire year. 
And so just read that. It tells you which passage to read. Think about what you're reading and then do what it is that Jesus is encouraging you to do. Start where you are. Don't try to do too much. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you because he will. Life groups, if you're a part of life groups here at Foundation Church, those are ending this month. Many groups take a break during the summer. And so here's what we would advise and encourage you to. There's a new believers group that meets at 1030 on Sunday mornings here at Foundation Church, right here in the hospitality suite. If you want to keep going, keep growing, you want to get unstuck, this group is for you. They're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark and just kind of walking through that and talking through that through the month of June. If you want to be a part of that, sign on your connection card and let us know or just show up. And then finally, some of you, today's message is confirmation of what you believe and how you actually live already. So what do you do? Stay humble. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you advance on the narrow way. Work in conjunction with His Holy Spirit and enjoy and be amazed at what you see Him doing in and through you. And then understand that there's more. There's far more that He wants to give you and show you. Freely you have received, now freely give. Father, this morning we thank you for our service today. We thank you for your truth, Lord. We thank you that you love us so much. We thank you that you're patient with us and you want us to experience life in your son, Jesus. God, thanks for speaking to us. Show us what to do now, what to do next, Lord, in following your son. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, thanks for spending part of May 19th with us here at Foundation Church this morning. We appreciate that. We prayed at the beginning of the service that God would speak to you. We trust that he has through his word. And he's going to help you live out what it is that he's spoken to you. He promises to. And I'm encouraged by that. Hope you are too. Today's the last day I will see a good bunch of you. Uh, Because you won't be here next Sunday. It's Memorial Day weekend. I'm not saying you should take off. I'm saying that if you are not here next Sunday, I won't see you till maybe next September or this September. So I hope that you take care of yourself out there. I'll be praying for you. Appreciate it. Uh, Otherwise, I'll see you next Sunday because I'll be here. And then I'll say goodbye to you. But until then, it's time for us to roll. I'll see you. Have a great rest of the day. See you next time.